in the third part of our facial trauma workshop, we will go through dislocation of the jaw joint. We will essentially be discussing an anterior atraumatic jaw joint dislocation. The jaw joint is also known as the temporomandibular joint. So in this section, we will discuss what to do when somebody cannot close their mouth. So we will imagine a scenario when you are sitting around a campfire in an austere environment <clears throat> and there is a shriek and somebody shouts, she can't close her mouth. So you rush across to her and this is what you see. So patient will be in excruciating pain and very frightened. Normally, both the jaw joints <clears throat> dislocate at the same time. However, you may have the situation where one jaw joint has dislocated and one is in the normal position. In this situation, the jaw will deviate. It will deviate to the normal side. So this jaw is deviating to the right hand side. So the right is normal and the left is dislocated. The patient is frightened because she cannot close her mouth and is in excruciating pain. Where does the pain come from? The pain comes from the severe myospasm which is taking place. When the, you go towards a patient, <clears throat> you will see that there is excess salivation. The patient often presents himself or herself with saliva drooling out of an open mouth. Saliva just pours out of the mouth. <clears throat> then, when you take your finger and put it in front of the tragus of your ear. So this is the ear, that is a tragus. You're taking your finger, putting in front of the tragus. And then you open and close your mouth. Open and close your mouth. You will feel your condyle bobbing up and down in this location. What is a condyle? The condyle is the top part of your jaw joint. So that is what you're feeling bumping up and down in front of the tragus in this location. However, if the patient's jaw joint has dislocated and you put your finger in front of the tragus and you palpate in that area, you will not feel the condyle bobbing up and down. What you will feel is a deep concavity. And then as you slide your finger anteriorly, anteriorly you'll suddenly find a hard bony lump anteriorly because that is the location where the jaw joint has been dislocated to, right? So now, why did this happen? So this is your ear. Here are your teeth. So anterior to your ear is the jaw joint. This jaw joint sits in this concavity. This concavity is called the mandibular fossa. This is your mandible. This is the body of the mandible and this is the ramus of the mandible. The back portion or the posterior portion of the ramus of the mandible is your jaw joint. Now this entire part is known as the vertical part of the ramus of the mandible. In this posterior section is the jaw joint and the top part of this jaw joint, this rounded knob here is known as your condyle. So your condyle or this rounded part which looks like a thumb rests in the saucer which is the mandibular fossa in front of your ear. Now right in the anterior part of the mandibular fossa this here is a bony lump. This bony lump which is going around like that is known as your articular eminence. Now this bony lump is the gateway to your temporomandibular joint or to your jaw joint. So your condyle, which is the top portion of your jaw joint, should be resting in the mandibular fossa behind this articular eminence 
and this whole area here is known as temporomandibular joint. So what happens in the dislocated position? In the dislocated position, this, the condyle of your temporomandibular joint resting on or attached to the vertical part of the ramus of the mandible jumps in front and instead of staying behind the articular eminence is now in front of the articular eminence and then cannot go back. It cannot go back for two essential reasons. The first and the most important reason is when the jaw joint dislocates, the muscles of mastication in that area are very, very strong. And when it dislocates, the muscles go into a very strong myospasm. And as you go into the myospasm, like a normal cramp, they shrink. So they hold this jaw joint in position because their length is altered to a certain extent because they're in myospasm. And with the <clears throat> excruciating pain in that area also prevents the patient from pushing the jaw joint back. The other reason, of course, is our articular eminence, but it's mainly the myospasm which is forcing it to remain in front of the articular eminence. So two things cause it, mainly the myospasm and then, of course, this bony lump, which is known as the articular eminence. So we have to get it past this bony lump below, backwards and back into this area here. Right, so let us recap. So this is the ear directly in front of the ear in this mandibular fossa that is your articular eminence and that is your condyle bobbing up and down in this location here. Okay, so that is a location. Now briefly we will diverse from the subject and talk about other types of dislocations. So you could have traumatic dislocations. In this case, you must check the airway, check the C-spine, make sure there are no teeth which have been knocked out, make sure that there's no teeth which have been displaced, fractures of the mandible, check in the ear for any bleeding, check the base of the skull for any, any battle signs, which would be your classical basilar skull fracture. You should not also feel any crepitus or instability in the jaw or swelling of the neck. The patient should not be having any trouble breathing in this particular situation. Now, if you find any of these factors exist, the patient requires a very, very urgent medivac and they will need a sort of an open reduction or an operative procedure in the healthcare facility where the patient has been medivac to. So we are only going to discuss anterior atraumatic jaw joint dislocation. And the first technique which we are going to discuss is the traditional technique. Now in the traditional techniques, one might have heard of the gag reflex in reducing a dislocated jaw joint. What is a gag reflex? Is that you take any object, cotton, cloth, and you irritate the roof of the mouth, which is essentially a soft palate. As you irritate your soft palate, the patient gets this huge gagging sensation and this will cause a reduction of the dislocated jaw joint to take place. Statistically and historically, it has got a very poor success rate. The most common traditional technique involves us or the operator putting our thumb in the patient's mouth. There's obviously some hazard involved in this situation because when the patient closes their mouth as you're reducing the jaw joint, the patient might bite on your thumb and cause the bruising of your thumb in this area. Now, how do we reduce the chances of that happening? Is essentially when you're doing this is by repetitive reinforcement to the patient that you let me reduce your jaw joint. Don't try to close it yourself. Let me do all the work as your operator and repeatedly mentioning that to the patient. Then you can take some protective measures like taping some gauze to the end of your thumb or wrapping some gauze at the end of your thumb to prevent the patient from biting on it. And the third technique is instead of putting your fingers on top or the occlusal surface 
of your lower last molar teeth. We put it on the bony ridge on the cheek side of the bottom last molar teeth. That way, when the patient bites, at least your fingers will be not resting on the top surfaces of the lower molars. They'll be on the side of the lower molars. That will save them damage to a certain extent. And the last way is to protect your thumbs is by using the more contemporary techniques, which is your syringe technique and your extra oral technique, which we will discuss later on. So let us look at the intraoral traditional technique in detail. As I said, the thumb goes inside the mouth. Where does the thumb go? The thumb goes on the top or the occlusal surfaces of the lower molar teeth. The remaining fingers are going outside. Where do they rest? They rest along the lower border of the mandible extra orally. Then, what we do is that we exert a downward force with our thumb. Now, this downward force is, should be just sufficient. If this is the dislocated jaw joint, your downward force should be just sufficient to get past this articular eminence. So basically, what we do is that we exert a steady, constant downwards force on the lower molars with our thumb. We might have to gradually increase this force and it could take up to five minutes until you feel the condyle move or what we can say is until you feel a give sensation. So what has happened at the start when you're putting your uh, force downwards and posteriorly on the molar teeth, initially you feel a strong resistance. This strong resistance comes from the myospasm. As you're constantly increasing the pressure on the patient's lower molar teeth with your thumb, you're gradually overcoming the myospasm. And this might take up to five minutes. Once you overcome the myospasm, then you'll feel the condyle move or you'll feel a give sensation. Once you feel that, then you guide the, the lower jaw backwards and upwards into its correct location. So basically, it's not forcing it backwards and upwards. It's guiding it backwards and upwards once you have overcome the myospasm. Let us recap. So we told the patient, relax, don't bite my finger. I will do all the work. I will guide your jaw into its correct location. You don't close your mouth. Then we put our thumb, which goes onto the top surface of the last molar teeth. Location is the key. You have to go all the way back to the last molar teeth. That way you'll get the maximum direction of force, maximum efficiency. Then the rest of your fingers are spread along the lower border of the mandible. You can see how they're spread along the lower border of the mandible. Okay, right from the angle to the chin, they're spread, yeah? Then what we do is we exert, this is the articular eminence, this is the ear, that is the mandibular fossa, this is where the condyle should be. But it's dislocated in front of the articular eminence here. So we exert a downward force to get it past the articular eminence. We give a gradually increasing force, could be up to five minutes, till you feel a give sensation or you overcome the myospasm. And then you guide it backwards, guide it backwards and guide it upwards to its correct location. Right? So let us recap. Both the sides are being reduced at the same time. The thumb is going in, surrounded by gauze, Downwards force till you overcome the myospasm, then you guide it backwards and upwards. In, so it goes backwards and it goes upwards. However, in some occasions, I say it's easier to do it one side at a time. So your dominant hand thumb goes inside the mouth, fingers outside the mouth. Your non-dominant hand rests in front of the ear where the location of the condyle should be checking its position. You exert a downward force on one side overcoming the myospasm <clears throat> and then you guide the mandible backwards and upwards. So you reduce the side, leave your non-dominant hand here. Do not move your non-dominant hand. Take your dominant hand to the opposite side. 
Put your thumb on the last molar, fingers outside, overcome the myospasm, guide it backwards and upwards. Once you've done that, you check the midline, you check the bite, and you make sure it's all done properly. So you confirm that the joint is connect position by checking midline and the bite. So you can do both the condyles or both the jaw joints at the same time, but sometimes it's easier to do one and then the other one. Now let us look at the syringe technique. In the case of the syringe technique, in some studies, it has been shown that it might have up to 97% success rate if done within two hours of the dislocation. What is the basis of the syringe technique? What does it rest on? It rests on the fact that you are utilizing the patient's very strong master muscle, which is one of the strongest muscles around, to pivot the jaw joint. And you are using your syringe as your fulcrum. And the syringe as a fulcrum will be pushing the mandibular condyle downwards below the articular eminence and back into its place. So it's a pivoting action around a fulcrum using the masseter muscle, which will guide the mandibular condyle downwards and then back into its place. So the trick in this technique is to use the right size of syringe. So the choice of syringes would be five millimeters or 10 millimeters, but it should be large enough for the patient to bite or rest on it with his or her molar teeth in the dislocated position. So it should be big enough to do that. Once the patient bites on it on with his or her molar teeth, you then ask the patient to push the jaw forwards. As the patient pushes the jaw forwards, this syringe acts as a rolling fulcrum and it's pivoting the jaw joint forwards, then like so. So you ask the patient to push the jaw forwards like so. And then you tell the patient to pull the jaw backwards like so. So forward, backwards, forward, backwards on the rolling fulcrum. So pushing the jaw forwards using the syringe as the rolling fulcrum, then pulling it backwards. Again, you see that the syringe is acting as a rolling fulcrum. So patient keeps doing that back and forth, back and forth, rolling over the syringe. And because the muscles are working in concordance with each other, the condyle slips, moves back into its normal position. There are a few practical modifications to this. What happens is that in the dislocated jaw joint position, it could often happen that the patient does not have enough strength in the jaw joint to push his or her mandible forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards. So what you do then is that you hold one end of the syringe. As an operator, you hold one end of the syringe and you tell the patient, push your jaw forwards, biting on the syringe. So as the patient pushes the jaw forwards, you rotate the syringe forwards, helping the patient to get over the inertia and assisting him in rolling his jaw forwards. And then you tell the patient, pull your jaw backwards. As the patient pulls his or her jaw backwards, you're rolling the syringe, getting over the inertia and assisting the patient in pulling the jaw backwards. So you assist the patient forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. You as an operator assist the patient to move the jaw forwards and backwards. Now, if both the jaw joints are dislocated, you would normally put the syringe on one side and this jaw joint, if I put the syringe on this side only and push the jaw forward and backwards, this jaw joint will reduce, go back into its location and the other jaw joint normally automatically follows. If it does not happen and the other joint remains in the dislocated jaw joint position, then, and this one has been reduced, you take your syringe out, put it on the opposite side and this and work on this undislocated or sorry on this dislocated jaw joint, repeating the procedure, pushing the jaw forwards and backwards and this side will then reduce. So you do one side at a time if the, if the abnormal side does not reduce at the same automatically. Sometimes patient might be comfortable holding the syringe through and through 
from right side to left side and pushing his or her jaw forwards and backwards against the syringe going all the way from right to the left. If the patient feels comfortable doing that, you might adapt your technique in those situations. So once a jaw joint has been reduced and goes back into its correct location, the first thing to do is to put a cool compress. Then you put a barrel bandage on the patient and liquid diet for 48 hours. Soft diet for 7 days, anti-inflammatory drugs for 3 days. So here we summarizing it, syringe is in, patient is moving the jaw forwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. Muscles are working in concordance with each other. You reduce this side, that side will go back automatically. If it doesn't, just repeat the process on the opposite side. The extraoral technique. In the extraoral technique, in a normal jaw joint, if that is your ear, that is the sausage depression in front of the ear and that is known as the mandibular fossa. This bony lump is the articular eminence. Here is your mandible. The vertical bit is the ascending part of the ramus of the mandible and at the back portion you have this thumb-like or knob-like process which is known as the condyle and your condyle should be resting in the clinoid fossa. Now the front part of the vertical or ascending part of the ramus of the mandible, the front bit goes upwards into this sharpish pointed projection and this sharpish pointed projection is known as the coronoid process. Normally you cannot palpate the coronoid process. However, when the patient is in a dislocated position, now this is the dislocated position. So this is the articular eminence, this is the mandibular fossa, this is your external auditory meatus or where your ear should be. Your condyle should have been here behind the articular eminence. But it is dislocated. So therefore, is it, it's in front of the articular eminence. So in this location, this is your jaw joint. This is the ascending part of the ramus of the mandible. The back portion is your thumb shape or knob shape projection known as a condyle. And the front bit is your sharpish pointed process known as a coronoid process. Now in the dislocated position, you can actually palpate the coronoid process from the cheek. So you can palpate it on the cheek like it feels like a sharp pointy bony bit. And this is the basis of this technique. So you take your thumb, your thumb, now your thumb rests on the cheek where you can palpate the coronoid process. So it's resting on the cheek, yeah? The remaining fingers of this hand rests behind the angle of the mandible. So the remaining fingers of this hand is behind the angle of the mandible. Your thumb is resting on the cheek where you can feed the coronoid process. Now simultaneously, your other hand is actually on the opposite side behind the angle of the mandible and the thumb of the opposite side is resting on your cheekbone prominence on the opposite side. Simultaneously, what you do is with this hand, you exert a posterior, persistent posterior and a slightly downwards force. So persistent posterior and slightly inferior force. So persistent posterior force with this hand which is resting on the cheek where you can feel the coronoid process. So here is your posterior force persistently on this hand and simultaneously with this hand or the opposite hand you do the jaw thrust maneuver, jaw thrust maneuver, jaw thrust maneuver. So you are twisting the mandible <clears throat> to a certain extent and this side will then reduce. <clears throat> so, so once <clears throat> you reduced this side, <clears throat> this side will automatically reduce. If this side does not automatically reduce, what you do is you leave your thumb on the reduced side <clears throat> and then take the thumb on the non-reduced side and persistently put posterior pressure on this thumb and on this thumb 
which will cause this condyle to then get reduced. Okay, so let us summarize this with a video. So you can see here, we are reducing this side. Thumb is going in, jaw thrust here, so this side gets reduced. <clears throat> and then you leave your thumb on this side, take your thumb to the opposite side and press together with both your thumbs and that clicks the mandible <clears throat> into its correct location. Now what happens if you are away from the site? If you're not there and you come back after two to four hours <clears throat> or even a day. So this is now a delayed treatment and the myospasm has set in totally around the jaw joint. So in these circumstances, Historically, it's found that traditional technique does not work well. If you have access to sedation, it will work. However, if you don't have access to sedation, if you cannot medivac or medivac is not available and you want to reduce this jaw joint, <clears throat> there is no access to sedation. Historically, it's found that the extraoral and syringe technique have a slightly higher chance of work success without using sedation. So basically the next option you have is if you don't have sedation, if you cannot medivac and if you have a decent skill set and you're comfortable with regional anesthesia, you could use a deep temporal nerve block and a masseteric nerve block to numb that side and that will help you to reduce the jaw joint. If both the jaw joints are, are dislocated, you should generally only need to give it on one side and the other side will automatically reduce then or will reduce with less degree of force because you've overcome the mouse spasm on a particular side. So you should attempt not to do it on both the sides. It's generally preferred to do it on one side and of course, you should have the skill sets of being comfortable with a regional nerve block and the situation should be such that you cannot get a medivac because in these situations, strongly advised a medivac. Now, why? That is because the faster you reduce a jaw joint, the less is the myospasm. However, if your delay is uncontrolled and you cannot do it, then the myospasm becomes self-propagating and it gets really hard to reduce this jaw joint. So in just in these rare situations, if you have the skill set, if you want to do it, let us discuss how we give the regional nerve blocks. Now the regional nerve block, which we will first describe is the deep temporal nerve block. The deep temporal nerve block, you take your index finger, <clears throat> your your index finger goes on top of the zygomatic arch and it follows the zygomatic arch anteriorly. So essentially, we are taking our finger and we are following the horizontal part of the zygomatic arch. So we are sliding it along. As we slide it along, the horizontal part of the zygomatic arch turns to the vertical zygomatic process. And this is the point we want to stop. So we've taken our finger, our index finger, we slid it anteriorly till the horizontal meets the vertical zygomatic process. So this particular point. Now we press our index finger here. When we press our index finger, it feels the softness in that area. What is the softness? The softness is your anterior temporalis nerve fibers. Now, if I take a needle and push it parallel to my index finger till it hits the bone, what bone is it hitting? The greater wing of the sphenoid bone. And once I hit the bone, I aspirate and inject 0.5 to 0.8 ml or 2% lignocaine. That will numb your deep temporal nerve fibers. So you've got to wait for at least two minutes and you should use a 30 gauge needle. So the amount of anesthesia you need <clears throat> is quite little, more towards 0.5 than towards 0.8 ml in that area. What are the possible complications of this technique <clears throat> is that the patient could get major numbness on that side of his face, would have difficulty, could have difficulty closing the eye because of the numbness, could have like facial numbness and more loss in motor sensation on that side of the face. 
and also there's a deep temporal veins here so therefore you have to be careful and aspirate before you inject now how do we give <coughs> a macetric nerve block we will discuss that later <clears throat> first we will discuss or summarize this with a video so what you got to do is to follow the green arrows so you're following the zygomatic arch anteriorly till this cross area so you're following it anteriorly till it joins the zygomatic process so we stop here that is the point where your cross was so we gone horizontally till it meets the vertical we go along the horizontal till it meets a vertical zygomatic process rest the index finger here <clears throat> when you press here you'll feel the anterior temporalis nerve fibers you push your 30 gauge needle in parallel to this index finger it hits the bone the greater wing of the sphenoid you aspirate and then you inject 0.5 to 0.8 ml of, of lignocaine with adrenaline once you've done that let us try how to give a macetric nerve regional anesthesia now you got to remember that the patient is in the dislocated position so the whole anatomy in this area has changed so that is why we try to concentrate on the anatomy which cannot be changed that would be the zygomatic arch and the ascending part of the ramus of the mandible because that will always be there so we grasp the ascending part of the ramus of the mandible with our thumb and our index finger so we grasp this bit then we take our index finger and index finger rests on top of the zygomatic arch like so and then we follow this index finger down and you'll find that when you follow this index finger down it drops into a little concavity that little concavity is your mandibular notch which is this area here and coming out of the mandibular notch is your masseteric nerve which is here so that is what we want to locate and now at the back of this finger so if your finger is here and here at the back of this finger is your condyle which is in the area between your index finger and the tragus of the ear so you take your injection and you push it backwards to this index finger it hits the bony lump which is your condyle it's hitting the bony lump here and then you aspirate and you inject 0.5 maximum 0.8 ml of local anesthesia which is a lignocaine mixed with adrenaline and that is where how you get the macetric nerve block for in this technique you have to remain on the superficial or the outer aspect of the condyle avoid the inner aspect of the condyle because that is where all the blood vessels are so try to avoid the inside keep your needle on the outside of the condyle again complication of this technique could be total paralysis on that side of the face with your local anesthesia if you have used it in that area so let us summarize this technique so here we go now we concentrate on the blues thumb and index finger grasping the vertical part of the ramus of the mandible um, thumb and middle finger the index finger goes on your zygomatic arch goes downwards so this is thumb and middle finger index finger thumb middle finger index finger on the zygomatic arch you follow it downwards as you follow it downwards it drops into this depression which is your mandibular notch is dropped into the depression so your condyle is here your condyle is between your ear and your index finger you take your needle try to aim for the outer part of the condyle aspirate and then you inject 0.5-0.8 ml of local anesthesia we fully appreciate not many um, uh, um, uh, expedition medics would want to try this technique and that's totally understood many of you all will be more comfortable with some degree of sedation if available so therefore this is in a unique situation where you don't have any sedation and where like me you're comfortable with regional nerve blocks rather than sedation you cannot get a medivac and you're stuck with this patient for a protracted period of time and you have to do something it is for the rare circumstances one must communicate to the patient all the possible complications that could be involved and as long as there's good communication good understanding and you built up a certain skill set then you may think of using this technique another technique is known as reciprocal relaxation where you tell the patient to bite on 10 spatulas and you keep building the spatulas up 
till the patient's mouth actually opens more, a little bit more than what it was at that time. Then you wait for a good period of 10 to 15 minutes till the muscles sort of relaxing and they get over the spasm and then you can reduce it. So you force the mouth open to a certain extent and you can wait from one minute to 10 to 15 minutes for it to overcome the myospasm and this will help in reducing the jaw joint. <clears throat> I must admit I've never used this particular technique before but it is, it is there in the literature and I've just presented it in case any of you all feel comfortable or in a situation or in a corner uh, where you could possibly use this technique to get out of a tricky situation. Penthrox. Can you use Penthrox to give you sufficient analgesia to reduce this jaw dislocation? Now, as you know, Penthrox is essentially methoxyflurane. And this is not only an, an anesthetic agent, but it can be used for short episodes of pain also. Now, it has been um, written by an article by Prof. Babel that this technique was used on children. And that is the one and only article which describes this technique. There is a lot of anecdotal data where this has been used by this technique. But this is the only one where it's briefly mentioned that we can use Penthrox by this technique. Which technique are we referring to? So in this technique, the problem is in the dislocated jaw joint position, the patient does not have enough force in his soft tissues to establish a closure around the whistles and enough negative pressure to inhale on the Penthrox whistle. So therefore, we have to adapt to use the Penthrox whistle. Now, how do we adapt it? For a start, we tape the diluter hole because in this technique, we're using the Penthrox whistle with an inhalation mask. And that is less efficient as when the patient can grasp the Penthrox whistle through a tightly pursed lips and have enough negative pressure to suck onto the Penthrox whistle. Because this is not possible in a dislocated patient, we are going to use it with an inhalation mask. And that is why we want to increase the concentration of the methoxyflurane from 0.1 to 0.2 to 0.2 to 0.4 by taping the diluter hole. Next, we have to possibly go for a slightly larger sized inhalation mask. That is because the patient in the dislocated position, the jaw is open and it's pushed forwards. So normal inhalation mask will not give him a sufficient airtight seal. So therefore, to overcome this anterior placement of a mandibular condyle in its open position with saliva drooling out, we may be forced to use a slightly larger size inhalation mask. The next thing is that you take the end of your whistle and you jam it into the end of the inhalation mask. So you push it in and you hold it in place. And then you tell the patient to inhale, but you have to be careful because there will be lots of air leaks and the residual gas leakage in an enclosed space could have consequences. So you must be aware of this technique. It is not a common technique, but there's a fair few anecdotal data where this has been used. And this is another tool in your armamentarium to get you out of a sticky situation when there is no Madiwak and when you have access and enough skill sets to try this technique out. But of course, it is not a well-registered technique. So you have to be cautious in this respect. And that ends our facial trauma workshop. If you have any questions, you can email me on this. So basically, this is our website and there is a contact form there where you can email any queries which you have. Thank you so much. Cheers.